take first the idea of righteousness as ethical behavior. There is in many circles a highly popular understanding, sometimes called a covenant of works, which could be simplified by saying, okay, this is how it goes. First, God creates humans and tells them they've got to obey certain laws so that they will be righteous and have life. They break those laws. Then God sends Jesus, who did manage to keep God's law. Thus, he acquired righteousness and so life. And then God transfers, imputes, reckons, whatever, that righteousness of Christ to believers. So though they don't have any righteousness of their own, they now have Christ's instead. That view is a caricature of Paul's doctrine. Now, a caricature may be better than nothing. If you're supposed to meet a stranger at a particular location and you've never seen them before, it might help if somebody just draws a quick caricatured sketch of them so that you can see that, you know, shall we say, he's bald and bearded or whatever it may be. Um, then you, But it may not actually be a full picture that would do for, say, a passport photograph or a portrait. This sketch of justification, this covenant of works so-called, simply won't work exegetically, partly because Paul never talks about the righteousness of Christ. And this is where a slide occurs and people say, well, he does talk about the righteousness of God. That's not what the righteousness of God means. The righteousness of God is God's own righteousness, as throughout the Old Testament. It's his faithfulness to the covenant and to creation. How then does the complex biblical language work? Think first of the ethical and the law court meanings. If someone in scripture is said to be righteous, the normal meaning is that their behavior corresponds to the proper standards. But then if you have a trial, and at the end of the trial, someone is declared by the judge to be righteous, that doesn't just mean, I think he's behaved appropriately. It means that the court has found in their favor, they have a new status. Of course, the verdict at the end and the behavior beforehand ought to correspond, but there's a subtle difference. After the verdict, the person is in the right legally. Justice has been done and their status is secure. It's not always easy to hold this distinction in mind throughout the relevant passages. But when we transpose this scenario of behavior and law court into the covenant relationship between God and Israel, we find the same thing at this larger scale. Important passages I've mentioned, Psalm 143 and especially Daniel 9. Israel is the covenant people of God, but Israel has failed to keep its side of the covenant. So Israel is brought to the court to face the covenant punishment of exile, Deuteronomy 27 to 29. But because God's righteousness is not only his justice as the judge, but also his covenant faithfulness as the covenant God, Daniel chapter 9, like the psalmist, appeals to God for rescue and restoration. Thus, the promised return from exile will be the covenant vindication, the verdict that says, you really are my covenant people. And in case you'd not realized, the whole point, the whole point was that Israel's exile, like Adam's from the garden, was the result of sin, so that the return from exile means that sins have been dealt with. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comforting words to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is accomplished. Her iniquity is pardoned. She's received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The forgiveness of sins and the return from exile absolutely go together. And in Isaiah 40 to 55, not by coincidence, we have the highest concentration in the Bible of references to God's own righteousness and also not, again, by coincidence, the sharpest focus in the Bible on the atoning suffering of the people's representative, the servant. Paul is therefore drawing on a rich and multi-layered biblical theme in which behavior, law court, and covenant all come together in the promised eschatology in which forgiveness of sins and return from exile constitute the single great act of divine covenant faithfulness. And this is what he sees as having happened in the Messiah. Sins have been dealt with, new covenant and new creation are launched, the cross and the resurrection. So how does it then work? It goes to work through the power of the Spirit, effective through the gospel. 
Several times Paul says that the very beginnings of Christian experience are the result of God's powerful initiative by the Spirit. And he couples this with what he'd seen on the street, on the road, in the lecture hall again and again. That when you announce the good news, a power is unleashed which makes the unbelievable believable, which makes the foolishness into wisdom, which makes the scandal of the cross the dynamic of new life. All of that comes into focus with the word faith. For Paul, when the gospel is proclaimed and people come to believe it, that is the sign that God is powerfully at work by his spirit. There can be no other explanation because this stuff is nonsense. It's foolishness. It's scandalous. It's a weak and silly message. But when it's proclaimed, it is the power of God. And because for Paul, the Messiah's saving death can be summarized, as we saw, in terms of his own, in Greek, pistis, his faithfulness to the covenant, his succeeding where Israel had failed. The pistis, the faith of the believer, is the sign that he or she is indeed enfolded in the pistis of the Messiah. Faith is not an arbitrary badge of membership. It is not the right kind of religion as opposed to some sort of wrong kind. It is the evidence that the Spirit has been at work through the gospel of the Messiah's faithful death. The work of the gospel, therefore, in producing precisely this faith produces Messiah-shaped people. 